To fully understand the horrors of living through war, there are a few films like the Pulitzer Prize winning 20 Days in Mariupol, a documentary from journalists at AP News who headed to the city an hour before Russian airstrikes started to hit in February 2022. The siege of Mariupol led to a reported 25,000 civilians being killed as Russia slowly broke through Ukrainian resistance and occupied the city. The small team, led by the war correspondent Mr. Slav Chernov, made the decision to stay. They risked their own lives to document the lives of others. It is unflinching, it is harrowing. There are scenes of innocent civilians caught up, children mortally wounded, as well as the raw panic looting and weapons fire getting louder as the team were starting to become surrounded. They were eventually smuggled out, escaping with the footage intact. Mr. Slav Chernov joins us now. Of course, to speak to you. Uh, first of all, congratulations, because in the last 24 hours, you've been nominated for an Oscar, Best International, uh, Best Documentary. And I guess the point of that is, first of all, you were pretty much the only eyewitness testimony on the ground, the bravery, but also the narrative in, in telling and weaving that story to pretty much world audiences. This is a bittersweet moment because it's all because of the tragedy that unfolded in Mariupol and the necessity to tell that story. I mean, we, we, we know, you know, you know the news, I know the news. Uh, we know that stories, even the most important stories are getting forgotten because there is so much important stuff. There is so much tragedies happening around the world. And the only way to save that, those stories, the only way to preserve them in history, and that's what I owe to people who saved my life in Mariupol, that's what I owe to citizens of Mariupol, to, to make sure that their stories and their tragedies are preserved. So every nomination, every, every prize just adds to that mission to, to preserve their stories, to, to make sure they're not forgotten. One thing that struck me is just that there's a, such an incredibly told chronology of events from the moment that you start to see people first arrive at the hospital injured and... You speak as well as you go through the streets and things start to get messy in terms of the chaos as they're being surrounded. Looting starts, people start to panic. A policeman says to you, it's life and war is like an X-ray, that it shows the good in people behaving better and the bad, they start to behave worse. I mean, that really tells a narrative for that whole story. I guess you were struck by that. I was struck by that uh, and I was struck by, by how much resilience and how much unity people in distress found like people who didn't know each other people who who never seen each other came together and found their strength found their community and there is so much hope yes it is difficult to watch but also there is so much hope in that and that hope kind of brought me to that thought that despite of everything people came together and it, it brought the best in them. But also, yes, you, you could see bad things happening because the city, the city is like a living organism. And, you know, we witnessed the slow and, and painful death of a city. That was, that was a task that we, we took on ourselves when we, when we tried, when we started editing the film, you know, how to show that, that painful process of, of, of dying and of the society and you know, of the city, <clears throat> but yeah, still there's there's so much hope within within that pain. Tell me about one thing that you struggle with in the documentary, which is trying to be the person who films and documents the importance of you showing the world versus the person who then says, "Can I step away from the camera? What do I do at this point?" And that difficult position you're constantly in. I am still international journalist. I, I went through several wars, and not only Ukraine, but it all started in Ukraine. And whenever I'm in Ukraine, I feel like I'm telling the story of my own community. So that's incredibly painful. That's incredibly emotional. And of course, you need to make a step back and you need to, and that's what Again, that's what I was trying to do in 20 Days in Mariupol. I, I'm not moralizing. If you hear the voiceover, if you hear me telling the story, I'm not moralizing anyone. I'm not imposing my own emotions on, on, on the viewer, on the audience. I just, I just tell the story. However, I am angry. I am angry and frustrated every day 
Yesterday, my hometown was bombarded, and I look at these images, and I understand how similar they are to what I was seeing in Mariupol. A child died from the Russian bombs yesterday. Dozens of people were injured, and it just gets over and over again and again. So I feel that Mariupol is not just a symbol of the beginning of the full-scale Russian invasion. It's a symbol of every city that is getting bombarded right now. It's difficult to see. It's kind of frustrating. I understand as a journalist that that people get tired of news, that people get tired of tragedies, they don't want to remember about them and know about them. But also, it seems absurd to me that, that we can actually get used to European cities being hit by bombs. Well, that is so fascinating to me, and I think this is why also it stands out and why it's won a Pulitzer, why you're also nominated for an Oscar, not just the, the storytelling, the bravery, the eyewitness account, but a lot of wars, a lot of fatigue. I've been a war correspondent in the past, and a lot that old narrative when war correspondents say, we had to tell the story, otherwise no one else would. And given the state of the world, that becomes less of a narrative. I mean, you must have been aware daily this could be the last time I see my daughters and my wife. And how did you deal with that decision? Did you think about it? Yeah, there is a mixture. Of course, I think about my daughters. Of course, I wanted to see them. Of course, I wanted to survive for them. But at the same time, there is such a mixture of, of a feeling of a civil duty and, of, and, and, and journalistic duty. And then, you know, you wake up, you wake up in, in, in a basement, bombs are falling around the hospital, the injured people are around you, and you see this nurse coming out on the street, gathering snow, melting the snow and wiping the floors with this water. And you see doctors that are using sheets to, you know, to dress the wounds. You see firefighters who don't even have water, but they still try to extinguish the fire. And then you're like, so what, do I just sit it out? No, I can't. Nobody can, I guess. And that is that gives me drive to, to continue. It's something that you documented, and you also feature the fact that, because we were covering this at the time, and your footage was used here on France 24, as elsewhere in the, in the world, big networks because they didn't have anybody there. But the likes of... Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov saying this is an information war, this is propaganda, these people are not real, this hospital was already cleared. What sense do you think that's had? Because actually it almost called out all of that because you were there, you verified it. Well, I did not witness that when I was, when we were in Mariupol. Those the only thing, the only thing, the only thing I was concerned, the only thing we were concerned, is just surviving and getting the footage out. And journalistically speaking, you, you don't, you don't want to fight propaganda. You're not surprised. We are not surprised by pro any propaganda, but and you don't want to fight it because it's impossible. All you can do is just to keep working. Journalists are not soldiers. They're not supposed to be. It's just the modern world suddenly made information a weapon and for extension it made journalists soldiers but that's not how it should be it's not the way it is it just it's it's dangerous talk to me about vladimir this is the police officer who took you around and helped you escape yeah. with in his car with his family that we see towards the end now he said he wanted to speak because he wanted this film to make a difference to people to see what really happened he thought it would change the course of the war I feel that he represents a lot of people who were in Mariupol, who helped us in Mariupol, and he he represents the hope and the wish to tell the world about the tragedies. And even, I think he knew that even if this is not going to change anything immediately, at least this is going to be a proof of what happened. It will be a statement and a message, uh, and eventually when people will start doubting the past, this is going to be a record. So it, he was injured recently, actually. He, he, he went to help civilians in, in, in the place of the, of the strike and he got uh, under the, another, the double tap shelling. His lungs were pierced by shrapnel. He, he barely survived that. Wow. And now he's in the recovery. So you know, it's, wow. he keeps doing what he's doing. I hope he gets better soon. And Mr. Slav, so good to talk to you. Mr. Slav Chernov, the film 20 Days in Mariupol, up for an Oscar and will be widely recommended for audiences around the world.